Hey, g'day, it's Preza. Thanks for stopping by. Now I'm taking a break from the Stuart Turner 10 engine today and I want to show you a little tool that I made many, many years ago when all I owned was a metal lathe in my workshop and I needed to make some parts that had features on them that you would normally carry out on a milling machine. So these are things like flats on shafts and squares and hexagons and so on. Now it's a little accessory that mounts on the compound slide of your lathe and you can duplicate those features on a metal lathe and you can do it with a high degree of accuracy as well. So it's here on the bench, let's have a look. Okay, this is it here. Now this is called a roller filing rest. Now it's a tool that was used a lot by watchmakers and clockmakers and small instrument makers and basically what it does is it allows you to place a file on top of these two rollers here and then you can move the file backwards and forwards at a controlled height above the center of your lathe. And then the height is adjustable so you can control the depth of cut. And you can imagine that trying to cut a flat or a square or something like that on a piece of stock of this size would be quite difficult in a milling machine. It's not impossible, but there's a, you know, there's a risk always that the tool pressure can deflect the stock or worse still, it can grab the stock and bend it sideways. But if you were to use this tool here on a metal lathe, you can grip the stock in a chuck or a collet or whatever you have, and then you've got minimal stick out and there's not a lot of tool pressure. And as you actually reach the depth of cut that you want, the tool pressure decreases until it's nothing. So you can control the size or diameter or whatever it is of the part that you want to create very, very closely. Now, all of the parts for this tool here were made at home here in the shop. Uh, a lot of it was just made by uh, cutting and filing, drilling and so on. Uh, some of the parts obviously have to be made on the lathe. Probably the only two parts that really have to be made on the lathe are these two rollers here. Now these rollers are soft steel, just mild steel, unhardened, and there are no bearings in these rollers. They're just running on a, a ground pin in these two extensions here. It's lubricated, of course, and you can make these as complex or as simple as you want. Uh, you could fit bronze bushes in these parts here, or oil art bushes, or something like that. Ball bearings. Um, you can harden these rollers. Uh, the danger with uh, hardening the rollers is that if one of them seizes up and you skid your file across it, you can damage your file. So I opted to leave these soft, and you can skim those if they get worn or damaged or just make new ones. But uh, that's it, it's really, really simple. Um, I'll go and put this on the lathe now, I'll have a look at it working. But I did find that there were some free downloads for a tool like this on a website called modelengineer.co.uk. I'll put a link in the description below. The gentleman that put the files up there on that website was Neil Wyatt. And uh, I've got the drawings here. Uh, now the camera probably won't pick this up. Uh, <laughs> no. But anyway, um, it uh, was published and uh, the designer was a gentleman named Bob Fletcher. So um, there are two sheets. Uh, it's got detailed drawings of all of the parts. And uh, I think you'll find that when you see it in operation, that would be a useful accessory for the lathe. Okay, let's go and set it up and we'll do some work with it. Okay, that's how I fit the roller filing rest to my lathe. So I've taken the normal tool post out of the compound slide, just slides back in place and we bolt it down there. Now if you've got a small lathe, you may want to take the compound slide off altogether and just mount it directly to the cross slide. Now in my case here, taking the compound slide off the Colchester is a bit of a pain, so <laughs> I didn't want to do that all the time. This is a quick and easy way to fit it. And this gives me enough adjustment here to work on small parts. Now I've got a piece of 3 16 drill rod in the collet chuck here and uh, this is typical of the size that you would be working on to do this sort of operation. So in order to cut a flat for example on that piece of material you just slide the rollers in place and then you can work out the distance between the end of the stock and this edge of the roller here. Now you can do that by trial and error, you can actually use your compound slide to offset use a DRO, whatever you 
uh, want to do in that situation. And then I'm running the safe edge of the file against the flange on the roller here. Now that sort of just saves wear and tear on the flange. Uh, if you don't have a safe edge on your file, you can just simply grind one. Alright, let's cut a little flat on here and then uh, we'll have a look at that and then we might sort of cut off all square. Okay, now after a while you notice that the file just stops cutting and that's when you've actually reached the limit of what these rollers will allow you to cut on that stock there. But the finish on that is sensational. <laughs> it looks really, really nice. I doubt that you could get a finish like that with a milling cutter in the milling machine. Now the only thing is that when you're using the safe edge against this edge of the rollers here, it doesn't actually cut a super sharp corner in there. I'm just going to turn this around and I'll use the other edge of the file just to clean up the vertical surface. And that's good there. So you get this beautifully flat consistent finish on the material and you can imagine if you just keep indexing the stock around 90 degrees each time you could cut a really accurate square on the end of that material. Typically this is what clockmakers need to do. So to cut out, it's like a square for a winding key, for example, this would be a really great way of doing it. All right, um, now I've got an indexing attachment attached to the headstock of my lathe here, and I can index around 90 degrees each time, or any other division that you'd use commonly. So I'll do, um, I'll go around to the next division, we'll cut another flat, and we'll just keep doing that. Then I'll show you in close up what that finish looks like. I don't know if you can hear that now, but it just simply stopped cutting. It's still rubbing against this uh, vertical edge here on the safe edge, but on the flat it's actually not cutting anymore at all. Okay, that's finished. Now, I didn't machine the end of the stock here, so it's not sort of cleaned up on that end surface. But we'll take this out now, have a close look at the square. We might even get a measurement across it and just see if they're equal. And then I'll show you how the indexing attachment works. All right, there's a good close-up look at the surface finish you get on that stock there. And I just use a, like a used hand smooth file. If you want better than that, you just get a brand new file. And I don't use any lubricant, I just cut this dry because uh, oil or WD-40 or something like that will make the chips stick to the teeth of the file. It builds up on the rollers and just makes a bit of a mess really. So uh, another thing is if you don't want the little rounds on the corners there, you just simply lower the whole device. There's a, there's a screw mechanism underneath that that allows you to lower the rollers down and you can then you know cut deeper and get rid of those rounds on the corners so that's uh you know that's a, a good close-up of, of what it looks like when you've used that process now i'm guessing you're wondering you know is it accurate uh, do we get sort of equal measurements across the flats well let's measure it 
All right, so that's our first one there, 3.79. Let's turn that 90 degrees. And we're getting 3.81, no, 3.8. So that's one one hundredth of a millimeter, and that's roughly three tenths of a thou. So I reckon that's pretty good, given that I didn't spend a lot of time on that. Uh, you know, if I was looking for absolute accuracy, I would have gone round again and taken a bit more care. But I think that's that's a pretty good result, just for a you know sort of a one-off test for the camera. So that's it um, now. I didn't show you how you adjust the height of that thing, so let's go back over the lathe and I'll demonstrate that uh, because I just realised I forgot. You idiot. <laughs> so there's a good look at how the height adjustment works on this. So there's just a knurled steel ring, it's just mild steel. This uh, threaded rod here is M10 by 1.5. If I were doing this again, I'd use a pitch of 1mm, so say M10 by 1. And that would mean that you could put, say, 50 divisions around the outside of that ring there. And then as you turn it, you get 0 0.02 of a millimetre change in height. Now, you can still do it with a 1.5 millimetre pitch, but it's a bit more awkward. Now, the ring is just mild steel. It's sort of recessed on the outside here, or relieved on the outside. And this sort of raised area here is what bears up against the underside of the, the rest of the tool. You could actually fit a thrust bearing there if you want to. In practice, I don't think it's necessary. Probably just like a brass washer would be as good. And the rest of the tool just fits down on these hardened steel pins here. And it's a little bit tight. Let's wriggle that around a bit. There it goes. And that stops the rollers from rotating. And the position of the rollers is then controlled by your compound slide or your cross slide. Now, um, like I say, it works great. Uh, the one that I put in the uh, description for the video, the link to the plans, has a much better way of adjusting the height. It's more controllable. Uh, in reality, this one here is a little bit awkward, but it's completely doable. And uh, for the jobs that come up where you need to put sort of flats or squares or hexes on very small diameter stock, I think this thing's a winner. Okay, uh, let's have a look at the indexing attachment for the lathe. Now this is the indexing attachment that I'm using on the Colchester lathe at the moment. Now this is the Mark II version of this device. The original one looked like this. So this ring here simply clamped to the end of the spindle extension and there was a single socket head grub screw that held that in place. And uh, unfortunately I didn't think ahead and I didn't put a piece of copper or brass on the inside. So when it clamped down on the spindle here it did tend to leave a mark or a burr in the spindle. And this one has a row of 40 holes on the outside, 36 holes on the inside. And this was just simply clamped in place. And then this plunger here would engage in either row of holes. Now, the only problem with that is that uh, you have to arrange the plunger, this thing here, so that it's normal to the surface of this circular disc here. Now, by normal, I mean it has to be perpendicular to the axis of the lathe running that way but it also needs to be perpendicular to a tangent that lies across the top of that disc there. Now laying that out in CAD is fairly easy. Uh, in practice, trying to make a bracket to hold that plunger that was completely perpendicular or normal to that surface there was a different matter. And I found that in reality it wasn't quite as accurate as it should be and sometimes the plunger would refuse to go in the hole or would jam in the hole and be hard to get out again. So this version here was one that I saw when I visited uh, a bloke named John Pierce, who lives in New Zealand. Now he's got a YouTube channel called the Hobby Machinist NZ. And when I saw the one that he made, I sort of went, oh, duh, why didn't I think of that? And this is basically a replica of the one that he made. So in this one, the disc, this plate here, is also bolted to a ring in the back here that you can't see and it's held in place with a single socket head grub screw but this time I thought ahead and actually put a copper pad on the inside and this also has a row of 40 holes on the outside and 36 on the inside now with that number of holes you can get most of the divisions that you need on you know workshop projects now you can't get some of the odd ones like the primes like 13 and so on but you can get you know 2, 3, 4, 6, 8, 10 and so on and if you wanted to you could make up specials 
So you could make these discs out of acrylic or aluminium or even plywood for that matter. If it's a one-off, you don't want it to be durable. You just want to have accurate spacing between the holes. So if you did need uh, you know, like a hole count like 13, you make up a special plate, fit it, and then if you want to just chuck it away later. Now the advantage with this type of arrangement here is that the plunger is just simply now has to be perpendicular to the face of the plate and that's quite easy to do. So you can see this arm here is slotted and it pivots and this whole uh, like arm and plunger and, and you know, spindle arrangement here gets taken off the lathe when I'm not using it. Normally there's a stud that fits in this hole here and that holds the end cover on the lathe. But if I'm doing this sort of work, I've got to take the cover off anyway. So it's really easy to align the plunger with one of the holes. And you then just simply lock the nut here. And then you can go ahead and just index the number of holes that you need. However, what I find is that it's a good idea to start and mark in chalk on the edge of the disc there the spacings between the holes that you want. And the reason I do that is that uh, if you're trying to do this on the fly, this plate is black because I parkerized it and also it's usually dark around the center of the lathe here and it's a bit hard to see the whole spacings. So if it's a critical uh, dimension that you need or a number of divisions, I would start by putting chalk marks there. You know, double check your count and then you can rub those marks off if you don't need them later. So with this indexing arrangement here and your roller filing rest, you can make some really interesting parts. So you could make parts that have uh, triangles or squares or hexagons or you could even uh, file an ellipse in a part. Uh, so if you're making a cam, for example, you can do that with a roller filing rest and you can work out your divisions here and your elevations for the rollers. And you could you know, actually machine a cam or an ellipse doing it that way. So that's how the indexing attachment works. And uh, you could adapt this for your lathe, uh, but I highly recommend you make this type here with a flat disc. Okay, I uh, think that's all I'm doing in today's video. Thank you very much for watching. In the next video, we're going to be back on the Stuart Turner engine, and uh, I've got some interesting stuff coming up with that. So for now, I'm going to say farewell, and I'll see you next time. Cheers.